which we are going to discuss. Okay, so if you remember, this is where we actually ended our discussion on last day with SHA 512 and uh, we have observed the methods adopted with respect to the block structure, how the hash functions are generated using the same. And in that we have also found out that each of these rounds are defined by some kind of a rules and some binary operations and some patterns of uh, bits, combinations of bits and based on that we are generating the final 512 bits of hash function. In the same manner we have found out that there is another methods, method which we call as the whirlpool technique. In that we have also observed that it is very similar to what the AES was except that it uses a specific set of element or specific set of uh, sub bytes or rather I would say state matrix which is 8 cross 8 bytes okay, instead of the 4 cross 4 in case of the normal AES and that's why we are calling this as a modified AES. Along with that the number of bit durations are also different which is apparently visible from this particular slide all right as well as you can observe the similarity that 10 rounds are also over here and each of the rounds will also undergo certain parameters or certain transformation for example there will be sub bytes there will be sub bytes and there will be something called as shift column instead of shift rows and we have mixed rows instead of mixed column and finally we have add round keys all right so they are very similar looking at that of AES and in fact the process adopted is also absolutely similar for example this is this was my sub byte stable which will be read in the same manner as that of the previous one the shift column will be a process in which we will shift based on the number of columns which you know, particular column we are in and based on that either zero rotation zero uh, shifting or seven shift bit shifting that is a maximum that is possible based on each and every column and also mixed rows is also same principle based on the template we will go on multiplying each row with the column matrix and finally we came up with the add expansion of the add expansion of the uh, key expansion strategy rather and in add round key the only difference compared to the previous one was that here the keys are generated by the method itself using a constant which will be there for each and every round 10 rounds so rc1 is that constant which you can observe over here rc1 is the rc1 is the uh, element over here which is a constant but again the individual round will be almost similar to that of the main rounds okay so that means that you can observe the round whatever is there in round one unlike to aes the key generation or the key expansion strategy is somewhat different compared to the previous one but it is very simple because in this case there were certain rule is adopted in which it is told that the first row will be a non-zero element which will be again filled up by the sub byte table which was not there in AES and the rest of the bits will be filled by all zero elements. So that is what the idea is. So its detection of this is relatively simple I feel compared to the add row process which uh, add round key process which is there in AES. Now keeping that in mind we now move on to message authentication code. This also we started off. So let us start off with this message authentication code again. So in that what I mean is, we, again I told you that the, the example will give you a better idea that if suppose Alice needs to provide the proof that it is Alice sending the message and not an intruder. That is the basic objective behind the math. Okay, it's, that's why it is called method, message authentication code. It means that we know that the message has been received at the receiver and we can understand from the process that if the hash function is present over there we can understand that the message is encap encapsulated by some means. But now how to determine that the same user has actually sent the message. You will soon find in fact today only we are going to start off with that, that there is not only this but we will also require something called as digital signature on top of the message authentication code that will make the user to be secured. I am sending you a message, how will you know that I am sending you a message? There must be some signature that is there from my side we actually prompt you that yes, that has been sent from the particular user. So that is basically the purpose of this message authentication code. And in that we have found out that usually this is the generic process that we are adopting for uh, a message authentication code. That means we have a message and we have a hash function which we all know. 
Now, along with that, there will be another set of operations that will go through where we will append. Basically, we are going to append. It can be prefixed or postfixed some amount of bits which will hold the identity of the user. Simple as that. And that particular bit will indicate some of the identity of the user. You will find in digital signature, the next one that I told you, along with that identity of the user, there will be a signature per user. Just like we will sign a document, digital signature also provides some kind of a signature that I am signing the document. All right, so that is us like a dual kind of a security that we are providing to the set of information. So signature, I'll come back later, but this is the observe that the message actually, the, the, the logic is that we are going to have a scenario like this, that with the message and the hash function, we are going to use some kind of a key. And this key is not the encryption key. It may be an encryption key, but it is not always the encryption key. And in that way, what we are trying to do, we are generating an M plus Mac. Okay, and if you observe this Mac is a attribute that is generated post the hash function over here. So post the hash function, whatever the image digest message digest you are getting on top of it, the Mac is working. And finally, this M plus Mac is sent through insecure channel. And that is an advantage because we are excluding the effect of uh, purely an idealistic scenario where there is a, uh, a scenario of this nature, like channel, you can see that this one, channel immune to change, which is purely hypothetical. There is no channel which is immune to change. So we are eliminating that concept by using this Mac. And if you observe that at the receiver, when we when the data is received, there is a process in which the M Mac, M plus Mac from that, the message is segregated out and the Mac is again authenticated over here. You can see the Mac is authenticated, just like we have done for the hash. So in that pattern, we will find out that whether the Mac is also correct, you will also find that soon we will see that whether the digital signatures are also correct. Then we will also check the hash function is also correct because the cryptographic hash function also indicates. So basically there are three ways in which we are trying to encapsulate the identity of the user as well as the message. Forget about the encryption part itself. That's a separate part itself. Okay, so just the user, the sender, the transmitter and the receiver needs to be integrated. The, the identity of the user and the authenticity of the user, the integrity of the user are maintained by this process. All right. So let's see the first one that I told you, and this is I was telling you on last day as well, that we can have a prefix max or a post postfix max, which means that there is some key which is which might be appended prior to the data or the message, or it can be at the back. It depends on the way we choose it. And in fact, there is a also combination where both the prefix and postfix can also be used. So the first of the lot where it actually started to have this uh, Mac uh, as such was the first we call is the nested Mac. And if you observe here, the same thing, very simple logic. There is this key over here. We have this key over here and we have a message over here. All right. And then the hash function is generated over here. But this hash, we are now going to call it as an intermediate hash. If we observe over here, intermediate digest, sorry, not the hash, intermediate digest. All right. So this message plus key is generating an intermediate digest. On top of it, we are using the same key once again. As it is acting as a, like an iterative process, we call it the nested Mac. But the, this same principle will be adopted in the next one, which is H Mac. Okay. So you will find that the same thing will be adopted with certain, again, addition. As you know that this all algorithms have been improvised at after a certain period. So this looks very simple as such. But based on this, the next one comes in and that is called as the hashed Mac. All right. Now in hashed Mac, what happens is very simple. You can see this diagram. As I said, the methods are mostly important over here. So if you see the first step, I have given it by step one, step two like that. So focus on the writing itself. The first step is the message is divided into n blocks, each of b bits. So this is basically the first step. So there will be a key which will be of b bits. And if it is not of b bits, b bits is some value, then it should be a padded also. Okay, maybe we can append some zeros also, but make it b bits. So that is given in the second step. The secret key is left padded with zeros to create the b bit key. Key can be anything, but we have to add those extra zeros to make it b bits. Now, these bits are now going over here and there is an operation which is coming over here as i pad. Just like we had for many such examples, this is a predefined value 
which is given for this algorithm and that algorithm is given by the value is given by something like this it's a combination 36x okay so don't ask me why because because this is an algorithm which was imposed like this and the rule was that it should be b by 8 okay that was the rule the b is the number of total number of bits so that bits divided by 8 that will be the number of elements which should be present over here this is just an example which is given so this is given by the ipad so the third step is the result of the earlier step is xor with a constant called ipad input pad we call it to create a b block again the value of the ipad is the b by 8 repetition of the sequence 3 and 6 all right so it will go on repeating itself based on the number of bits that we are working on with all right now these bits if you observe carefully the why it is a prefix uh mac you can observe that this has been made sure that we are connecting it over here so that's basically the prefixing we are doing it a prefixing so we have the m bit so we have the message bits appending with that we have b bits this process that i'm telling you know this appending of the bits this happens to be a very common technique for most of the communication pattern itself as we go on with the wireless communication later on like if you study you will find there is something called a cyclic prefix which is acted upon as a very similar thing when we are looking at uh, 5G and beyond or 4G and beyond technology, mobile communication. There also we call it that as a cyclic prefix, prefix. It's prefixed in the inset of the data. So anyway, so that's basically one of the, uh, I would say a flag, which will give us an indication that whether the, uh, the authenticity of the user is maintained or not. Now, after this, you can see the hash is generated over here. All right, now the hash is ever, ever generated. Now this hash is n bit. So let's see the next one. So the resulting block is prepended to n block messages. And the result of step four is hashed to create an n bit digest. Now this hash that you are looking at, this can be an SHA 512, which we have studied. So the generation of this n bit, this part, this hash function that you are looking at, this can be a 512 bit. All right. Now, based on that, you can see that the intermediate HMAC is generated. So the same intermediate HMAC that I told you in the previous case for the nested one is the same thing is happening over here. So this is my intermediate intermediate hash. You can see the step five I mentioned. Now that hash, along with the next set of padded bits and output pad is sorted once again. So you can see there is a pattern of it as well. So you can see this pattern is the pattern over here is zero one zero one and 1100. Zero, zero. Now this is a fixed value. Again, you can see B by 8 repetition. So the output pad is of 5C, 5C, and the input pad will be 3636 three, like that repeating. So this gets zored and you can get a new element, new intermediate value, which is B bits and B bits. So we have the portion which is there before the Mac, and there is a portion which is there for the message with hash function. And finally, you can see again, the hash is used over here. Another hash is generated. So two types of hash are generated. So making it more random in a way. Okay. Difficult to interpret the data. And finally, we are generating the Mac over here at the final stage. So again, to, just to repeat why we are trying to do this, because we are, we already know how the cryptographic hash function works. We know that the message should go through a hash function and it should generate a digest. But as we don't know about whether the message has been sent from the proper user, we need to authenticate the user by using this Mac, where this Mac is a kind of a signature, you can say. It's not exactly, but for colloquial language, let us understand in that way, that Mac is some kind of a uh, identity, it's kind of a signature, it's kind of a sign, it's like a stamp from a particular user, which will be appended with the message digest, and that will be sent over to the insecure channel. And at the receiver, there will be a comparison that will be made with the existing Mac and the received Mac. And if both the Mac is matching, then we will say that the, yes, the data has been sent from the correct user. Then we will again authenticate the Mac itself, like Mac, uh, the H Mac itself, uh, uh, not the Mac, the uh, hash itself. And we will also check that hash also that whether the hash is correct or not. whether the hash got someone, the intruder might have changed the hash itself, which is barely uh, not possible. But even if that happens, so all those checking will happen at the receive. All right. So this is basically what the hashed Mac is all about. Similarly, similarly, this is given actually the same thing, which I can opt out. 
The last one in this MAC, which happens to be the latest uh, of the lot, and that is called a C MAC or the cryptographic uh, MAC. All right. So in this case, what happens is the key that we were we were looking at the padded key uh, or the key bits which you are sending it separately and you are padding it with some zeros that is generated by the system itself. So the cipher key, the cipher text which is generated in one of the steps will be used as a key over here. So let's see the diagram. So if you close the order over here, okay, we have the message. We have the message log over here. So now you have you have a public key. Suppose you have a symmetric key for that matter. You can see the bottom it's mentioned. Symmetric key. Now, based on that symmetric key, the encryption algorithm, you can see this is my symmetric key actually. So this is used for encryption as well. So what we are trying to save is that generation of the separate key over here. And what we are trying to achieve, we are trying to achieve a C Mac which is coming somewhere over here. So what is happening? The generation of the C1 is fed to the next round. You can see the iterative process that is adopted. All right, so this is also a process in which it is a cipher based map and that's how it is done except the last round if you observe here the last round there is a, a n leftmost bit from the last block is the c is the c max so this is the last n bit block got it so you are generating one after another the last block which you are looking at there is another small key which is used A small key which is used over here. All right. So if you observe carefully, this small key that is a separate key itself, and that key generation is given at the bottom, which is over here. All right. Now how it is generated? Very simple. Again, very simple this part. So let me show you the next slide, which will be easy. So what happens over here? You can see that if this is I'm talking about the last key, this is small key. Okay. The capital K is for the initial key itself. The small key is generated by the process, and we have capital key with respect to the encryption algorithm, comes the visit, and there is a multiply by x on x squared. Now, x and x squared, I have already mentioned over there. If the padding is used, you can see over here, if padding is used over here in the message somehow, then we will use, you can see, multiplied by x if no padding, and multiplied by x squared if padding. What does that mean? If you check here, I have written it down. For this one, multiplied by x, x will be given by n minus two zeros followed by one zero. So there will be n minus two. N is the number of bits of the uh, uh, CMAC, the total duration. Suppose there are the, the, the total duration is 128 bits, for example. So 128 bit minus two. So 126 zeros followed by one zero. That will be the x that should be multiplied to the n bit that is there. Along with that, you can see the next one, which is x square. If padding is used, then it is n minus three number of zeros followed by one zero zero. So you can see this one, this one zero, and this one zero zero. These all are given from the Galois field, which we don't need. That it is because of gf to the power two to the power m from there. Actually, we are getting this, but we don't need that much of details. Just remember this, that if the padding is used, we are going to use the uh, x square. If no padding is used, we are going to use x. For x, if it gets multiplied, it should be n minus two zeros followed by one zero. And if it is n square or x square, then n minus three zeros followed by one, one, uh, one zero. That will be the multiplication factor. So based on that, we can generate an n-bit CMAC and in the same manner, we can check it with the receiver whether that is correct from with the existing one and the comparison is made and based on that, we can trigger that whether it is correct or So these three techniques which you are looking at, the MAC, the CMAC, uh, the uh, hashed MAC, the nested MAC and the cipher-based MAC, these are the three patterns that we need to remember for this thing. Again, as I said, there is no numerical or anything of that. So this is the method is only what is right. Right. This is again the just an example to show you that how this process works. Hopefully you have all remember, like understood that see one, this A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 are the message content. 
Now, suppose they go through the encryption algorithm. You see the diagram. It goes through the encryption algorithm. So, based on that, the C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, these are my crypto, the cipher text. So, what will happen? C1 will happen is K is the cipher key, the symmetric key, comma A1. But if you check C2, C2 is nothing but K, comma A2, ZOR, C1. You check here. C1 is so, supposed to be here. All right, so this is my C1. So C1 and we have M2 is coming. So that's basically showing over here A2 plus A2 ZOR C1 and we are using again the symmetric key K. So like that, we will go on doing it for the rest of the case. This is just a small example to show you. In this case, we are, we are having the cipher text used as the key one after the other. Right. So this is about what we have learned in this whole uh, process of hash function and the message authentication code. Uh, for that matter, and that concludes the discussion on module number five. Now, now let's discuss again the module number six. As I said, that this is the continuation to the authenticity and the integrity of the data set. And in module six, we usually have these three modules, uh, sub modules within module six. Key management and distribution. If you remember, this we had already done while we had studied actually the uh, RSA technique or even the, the uh, Dilly Heffman uh, oh, key yeah. exchange. There itself we have used this one. Remember that uh, there will be a center uh, processing unit which will distribute the session keys based on that the transmitter and the receiver will try to talk among themselves. So that same thing is key distribution. So that I might opt out for the timing because you already have discussed that. The first thing and the most important part over here is the digital signature because that's a very interesting one. And again, you will find the example of LGAML Again, you will come back to the elliptical curve crypto system once again, which we all know, the RSA technique, which we all know. So all will be repeated once again, but this time for the signature generation. Earlier, it was for the encryption key generation. Here, it will be signature generation. So let's see about digital signature first. And let's see from this point on, like how it is different. It's not different, to be honest. And the understanding of digital signature is absolutely same as that of what we do for a normal paper. So if you see here, the inclusion technique, a conventional signature is included in the document is a part of the document, whereas digital signature is a signed digital. Okay, so we send the signature as a separate document. You will find that all these algorithms, they will be identified by certain unique values and those values will be considered as a signature. All right, so that is the inclusion part. The verification method, the conventional signature, when the recipient receives the document, he or she compares the signature on the document with the signature on file just to match whether the file, uh, whether the signature matches, just like we do it in bank and all. We'll sign it and we'll see that whether it is matching or not. But here for digital signature, the recipient receives the message and the signature. The recipient needs to apply a verification technique. This is where the LGAML technique, the RSA techniques and all will be applied to detect whether the signature which was sent from the transmitter has been received at the receiver or not. Very simple. You just see this. It's very simple. That's why I'm telling you this cap to portion, try it not to leave any question out of it. These are very simple and methods. That is what you are supposed to write. When we have relationship also, there's another way. The relationship is that conventional signature, when we do it in a pen and paper, that is normally one to many. Okay, so that's the relationship that we have. We are signing it for many such documents, the same signature. But in case of digital signature, that is one to one. Per message, whatever we are sending, we will have a unique signature of it. You will soon find because the algorithm that we are going to test out, all the techniques, all the values will be governed by certain message which will go on changing. Okay, each and every time a different message comes in, you will have a different signature. All right, so that is the beauty of it. And duplicity also, the unconventional signature, a copy of the signed document can be distinguished from the original one. Same here, in digital signature, there is no such distinction unless there is a factor of time on the document. So there is a time stamp that will be considered for the verification of the data. Right. So this is basically how the comparison is made. And this is a basic simple diagram, to, not, not this to be honest. I think this will be better for you to understand. This is the simplest mode diagram to understand what is digital signature. I guess all of you understood it, but still, you can see Alice is there and Bob is the receiver. Now forget about hash function for the time being, forget about Mac and all those process for the time being. Suppose you have a ma any message, you have any message. 
So what we are doing over here is that the Alice will Alice will have certain kind of a private key. Based on that, it will generate a signature. You can see the block there, signing document. So that signing document, along with the message and the hash function and the message digest, whatever it is, that is sent to Bob. Now Bob will use Alice's public key. You see the receiver at the receiver side. Alice's public key. And based on that Alice's public key, it is trying to decipher whether the signature is correct or not. It is not checking the message. It is going to check whether the signature matches or not. If you check here, S is the signature. It's given in the diagram. So it will only check whether S and S prime is matching or not. All this process that we are going to adopt, we are not going to check about messages. Only we are going to check whether the generated signature and the received signatures are correct or not. Simple as that. You get? So if you see a digital signature needs a public key system. So definitely there will be two sets of key, same way the public and a private. And using that public key, unlike to the encryption, in encryption, what we were trying to find out, we were trying to find out what is the message being delivered. Remember in RSA, in LGAML and all other stuff, what we did, there was a message, whether the message has been received at the receiver, that's what we were checking. Here, nothing to do with message. Here, we are going to check only the signature. For that particular message, whether the signature is valid for that particular user. That's it. So that is where it is different from the crypto system because here, the, in case of digital signature, the private key and the public key of the sender, okay, that is being used over here. So Alice's private key, Alice's public key, both are being used. If you remember in case of the crypto system, we were using the public key to transfer, but the private key of the receiver was used to decipher the data. E and D, two keys were there, okay, so that's how we were done doing it. So now the first thing I can, I can see, this is called as signing the digest. So the, you can see that's what I was telling you, that all this hash and all what you are trying to do, this is my hash function talk. Suppose the map is also present, and you have generated an end map, yes, that is being signed with. Alright, so if you see there, the Alice is private key, we are actually focusing on that. We are only for bothered with that signing document. We are calling that as a signing the digest process, and that is being verified. You can see the right hand side, the verify block is there. So after the verification is done of the signature that yes, the signature is correct, then we will go on checking the MAC. If the MAC is correct, then we will check the hash or the message digest other. Based on that, we will go back and go back and go back. Yeah. There are two types of attack. I think that maybe skip, but we can just I can just show you at least because we are not going to invest much on this as a time. So first thing is no, something called as key only attack. Where the public key is known, public verification is key is known to the intruder. So these are, these are the possible attacks on the digital signature. Okay, so the first one is called as a key only attack where the public or the intruder might know the public key, public verification key. Based on that, it can duplicate the key. Duplicate the signature rather, not the key, duplicate the signature itself. Like many of you might be all aware of, like our signature has been like someone's signature, you might always find that's a forgery that we have done. In fact, the forgery word is there in the next slide. All right, same with the known message attack. Suppose you, you already are feeding the intruder that these are my public messages or the public key for that matter. You can see variety of messages known by the attackers. But suppose the attacker only is bothered with specific uh, requirement. So it will generate some kind of a method by which it can decipher what the signature is. Remember, all these attacks are only with respect to the signature verification or detection of the signature power. And chosen message attack, the attacker first learns the signature on an arbitrary message of the attacker's choice. And based on that, it tries to replicate and duplicate the signature. And once again, it will act as a middleman. And again, it will send the same information to the receiver. And the receiver will think as if it has been sent from the task. So same kind of attack, but in terms of signature this time. Next one is called as the forgery, as I already had told you, existential forgery. Here you can see that in case of the creation, the advisory of it, it will generate a M comma sigma. That sigma is not produced by the legitimate value. That means there is a message for that a signature is manipulated. So that's being called as there. 
And the other end is selective forgery where the message is changed. Okay, the message itself. You can see the aim has been chosen by the adversary prior to the attack. And he has changed the message itself. Let the signature be as it is. It changes the message itself. That's also kind of an attack itself. Where you are signing a document. Suppose you are given a blank paper and you sign it. So the sign is authentic, but the content of it is written by someone else. Can you imagine the scenario? The same scenario is this. You have given a blank check. Suppose you have signed. Someone put some value and it will be proven that you have signed the document and hence that amount of money is to be debited from your account. Same forgery. So that kind of thing is called as selective forgery. If the message is converted or message is fraud, but the signature is authentic. You can see the delta is the signature here indicating. Right? So based on that, there are certain techniques. As you can see, some of the known, some of the new, uh, the known names which you can observe over there. RSA, LGAML, all are known to us. Even digital, uh, elliptical curve digital signature is also known to us. So let us go one by one to understand the technique. Again, not much of numericals over here. First thing is the RSA. RSA, as we know from the crypto system, same thing adopted over here as well. If you see over here, the message is there, M. You can see it's illustrative is pretty okay. Message is M, S is signed, indicating the signature. But as you know, E will be the public key. In case of Alice, we will need one public key E and there will be another key which is N. All right. So N is basically the prime number that we work on. Okay, we have used Q as an example in most of the cases. And D is called as the Alice's private key. So both Alice's private key and the public key, these are the two important elements which the receiver should have. And if you say, check the function, there is a function f of n over here. f function. This function works on at the input side with respect to m, e and n. Message the public key of Alice and the private number, the, the, the prime number which is n. On the other hand, the s, the signature which is generated, the next function, the receiving function works on s d n. That means it will work with the private key of Alice, it will work on the s which is a signature and finally it will generate a value of m prime which should be congruent to m. So you can see the next slide. So key generation in the RSA is exactly same as the key generation in RSA crypto system. So nothing much there. E and N are public, D is private. Just the same thing which we did in the crypto system. Hopefully all of you can remember that. So this is what the primary objective of it. You can see the equation. Can you, can you check and verify all the same thing? M to the power T mod of N. We have done the same thing over there. P to the power T mod of Q. Same thing is mentioned only with the different data. So the same thing is made over here as private key. This is private key, so we should come over here. This is the message which is fed in. Mod of n where n is the, the prime number, which is fairly large. Based on that, it goes here. The final s, which is the signature. The signature is verified using the public s to the power p mod of. And finally, the generated one, m prime that you are looking at, is tested with the original message, which is m. All right. So based on that, we are trying to find out what is whether the signature is matching on say so m and m prime are matching on. So very simple process, same RSA technique except the formulas are different. If you remember in case of RSA, this was given by C equals to P to the power mod of Q. And in case of the receiver side, it was M equals to C to the power D mod of Q. So same thing, just the, the, the nomenclature has changed. The rest of the things are all the same. Nothing much. There we were checking the message, here we are checking the signature. Simple. This is an example, I think all of you can understand this, substituting it will get the answer, but just to brief on it, this is given as a, in the book itself. So you have P and Q, same way, so we can generate what is N, Phi N also we can generate, remember the process for RSA, we, had, we used to generate Phi N. So now we choose E, which is around 313, based on that we can calculate what is D, which can be E into D of congruent to 1, that's same formula. So that's the huge set of value that we are getting. And after substituting everything, I'm just leaving out these steps. You can see the M and M prime. This is what is going to happen. So you can see the process that is adopted. So you are generating from the M. You are generating what is S. 
So S is given by something of this nature. And finally, we are receiving the M prime over here. All right. And that M prime is should, should match. This should be M congruent to M prime. That's all we need to find. But again, remember, we are this M congruent to M prime doesn't mean that we are checking the message. Here it indicates that the signature is remaining intact. Whatever we have sent from the transmitter, it has remained intact at the receiver. Right? Right. So now the last one before we end up on today's lecture. So we have the L gamma digital signature as well. For that, let me instead of showing this one, let me I'll just show you the uh, step over here because I feel this will be a little bit more faster than you think. Again, the same thing, the LGAML process that we already have discussed over some time now. So if you see the process, just see the process, how it is done. Again, we will choose a value of Q, which should be a prime number and relatively quite a big number in fact. And then we are checking the alpha. Remember the primitive root calculation, we have done it in CAT2 and all the other process as well. So the same thing is over here. We have a Q and we will generate, we will find out what is the primitive root. Based on that, you can see we will choose XA. It's very easy to understand from the writing itself. So choose XA such that XA lies between 1 to Q minus 1. That's the same process. So if you see the YA we can generate, which will be my public key. Again, the same formula alpha to the power XA mod of Q. The same thing we are doing. Nothing fancy over here. All right, so we are generating XA, which is my private key, and the public keys are QD, the global parameter, whatever you call it, QD and YE. Okay, so now the signing part. Now, suppose we have the message, we have the message which is capital M. All right, that must, that, that must satisfy the equation over there. You can see that hash function. This is the only change we are doing. While we discussed about L gamma that time, we didn't know about hash function as such. So we were directly doing the message. Here you can see small m is equal to HM, where you HM can be generated using an SHA 512. Just a normal hashing that we are going to do. Based on that, we are going to find it out, provided small m is within the range of 0 to Q minus 1. We'll have an example to let you understand this. So first we are generating the keys. Now we are trying to generate the hash function. So after that, we are generate using these values to the digital signature formation. So please make a note of this because this is a little, this is where the basic focus is. The rest of the things are already there with you. So what we happens is the choose, uh, the spelling is wrong, choose K such that K belongs to 1 to Q minus 1. That's K, that's a random key. And but make sure that the formula or the, or the generation of the Q matches the second requirement, which is GCD equals to k comma q minus 1 that should be equal to 1 that means mostly will be a prime number four prime number so gcd of k comma q minus 1 should be equal to 1 so k should be relatively prime to that of q minus 1 now the first step remember the function of this algorithm is to generate s1 and s2 where s1 indicates the signature 1 and s2 indicates the signature 2 the equations are given by very simple alpha to the power k mod of q okay so that becomes s1 so similar to see the calculating c1 for l gamma crypto system just the same formula was there but the only change that we are looking at is the six, step number three so now here we have to find out what is my multiplicative inverse of k multiplied by q minus one which is all the otherwise given as k prime mod of q minus so basically k k minus one k k inverse mod of q minus 1 should be equal to 1 or congruent to 1, whatever you call it. So the multiplicative inverse needs to be found out using the process of Feynman's equations and all those other stuff. So we get the k inverse. That k inverse is substituted in step number 4. If you see here, whatever the multiplicative inverse we are getting, that value is around k inverse. Like we have t inverse, you know, what? e is equal to 1 in case of the other same thing. The k inverse M, M stands for the hash output minus X A S I. S1 is the first signature mod of Q minus 1. So this generates the S2. So what we are focusing on generating S1 and S2. So S1 is pretty relatively simple. 
straightforward. For S2, you require K inverse, which is a multiplicative inverse calculation. And the calculation involves the generated S1 to be used over here. So now the, you can see the last line, the signature thus consists of pair S1 and S2. We are only bothered with S1 and S2. We are not bothered with the message right now. Now, if you observe at the receiver side, very simple process. Again, two equations are used. One is V1 and the other one is V2. What is V1? V1 is alpha primitive root to the power M. M is the message, the hashed message, mod of Q. And V2 is Ya to the power S1. So you can see over here, you will require at the receiver S1 and S2. Both you require. S1 and S2, both you require. And based on that, you are checking whether V1 is equal to V2. So basically, again, I'm telling you, after V1 and V2, what is the conclusion? Yes, my signature has remained intact for this particular message. So that's the process that is adopted in exam. Let's take with an example and let's just finish it off. So let me just show you the example. Very simple again. So suppose I have the example where Q equals to 90. Right. So Q equal to 19 and 19 will have, as we already know from our previous experience, that we have number of primitive roots and you know the process of calculating the primitive roots. So 2, 3, 10, 14 and 15 are the primitive roots. From there, suppose we choose alpha as 10. So we have chosen alpha as 10. Alice chooses the private key X should be equal to 16 because see the range. It should be 1 to K Q minus 1. So Q is 19. So X is between 1 to 18. Within that, any value can be taken. So X here has been taken as 16. Now we calculate what is Ya, same way, substitute. And you will get a Ya which is equal to 4. So we now know the private key of Alice. We know the public key of Alice. We know the two global parameter Q and alpha. Is now sent over the internet or over the interface to the receiver. Before sending it, what Alice does, it generates the key for the signature. For that, it chooses small k equals to k5. Again, another random value based on the range. Check, please check this examples. Okay. Now S1 is generated pretty simply, alpha to the power k mod of q. So uh, here message is message is considered to be, you can see 14. This 14 that you are looking at, this is not the message. This is the hashed message or the message digest you can say. It will be provided to you if it is provided, it, like it should always be provided because no time will be there to generate a hash function to generate the final message. So ideally, whenever the message you will observe, that message which is a hashed message. Please make a note of this. If question comes in from the digital signature part, your message is basically, if, if we mention that the message is given by this, so the message will be, should be considered as the hashed message itself. Okay. So that is my 14 over here. And you generate K inverse, which is 11. And you substitute in S2. And you generate S1 and S2 as 11, 4. Please check here. 11, 4. Now at the verification stage, Bob verifies in the same manner. As per the formula, it substitutes the equation. And it generates 16 over here as V2. And V1 is also equal to 16. Remember, V1 is tested with respect to the S message, whereas V2 is tested with respect to S2 and S. But the conclusion wise, as, as, as per the algorithm, V1 should be equal to V2. So that has been verified over here, which means as a conclusion that the signature which was sent from the transmitter, that is from Alice, okay, that is restrained over here as well. It is not that it is testing the signature as 11,4. Please understand this. It is not testing over here. You can see the final answer. The answer is 16. It is not testing whether it is 11,4. It is just testing whether the signature has remained intact. If V1 is not equal to V2, then it will possibly there needs a retransmission of the data. It is not going to find out what is the signature. It is just going to verify whether the signature is correct or not. That's the difference. Because the finding of the, the receiving of the things will be only applicable for the encryption or the cryptographic system. Here we are not doing that. The receiver doesn't really know how the signature was made. The signature only needs to be validated. So that validation is done over. 
The other two methods also adopt in the same manner, which maybe we can discuss on Wednesday's class. Okay, and we can find out and we can finish it off with the six module as well. Because in module six, there is nothing much except for the digital signatures. That's important. Please. Eleven comma four. S1 was 11 actually. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. S S1 should be 3 here. Correct. Very good. This should be 3 comma 4. Correct. 11 is K, K inverse. While writing it made a mistake. Yes, it should be. Right? 3 and 4 is not going to check with the, at, at the receiver. It's just that whether it is kept intact. V1 is equal to V2. Because that V1, V2 is generated by S1, S2. So if S1 and S2 has changed somehow, then definitely V1 and V2 might not be, will not be seen. So that's the conclusion. Alright? So fine. We let us let us wind up here and we'll come back in next day to finish off this module itself.